Welcome to the ODI Lunchtime Lecture. I'm Hannah Redler-Hawes. I am the um, Director of the Data as Culture Art Programme at the Open Data Institute. And joining me today are Rohini Devasha, who is our online artist in residence, and Julie Freeman, who is the founder um, uh, of the Data as Culture Programme as an artist and as a curator. For many, many years, we co-directed the programme. Julie's now an art associate to the programme, um, concentrating on her own research, which continues to hugely inspire and underwrite the ethos of the programme. And um, Julie is a pioneer of using data as an art material and extending what we might mean by that term into a vast conceptual taxonomic and visually rich series of spaces through her immersive environments, kinetic artworks and um, experimental research. Um, uh, Rohini, who is based in Delhi, is the current online artist in residence, as I said, and her research brings together her interest in early scientific observational instruments, as well as the observational sciences across the board, as well as being an artist, Rohini is an amateur astronomer. And she would say that perhaps before we started working together, she wouldn't necessarily call herself an artist who works with data, but she's been interrogating what that means in the context of her practice and stretching all of our ideas about what that might mean. Um, so the format we're going to follow is that each of the artists, Rohini and Julie, are going to take turns showing very short clips of two films of their work each and talking about that. They will give each other brief responses to each other's work that build on their different different approaches to working with data and experiences with thinking about data art and living systems. And then we'll broaden that conversation up into um, uh, something that includes anyone in, in, in the in the Zoom who would like to participate in it. I'd also like to say thank you to Mark Barto of the V&A who invited the first iteration and in fact initiated the first iteration of this conversation um, which we did at his digital design weekend last September. So without further further ado, I'd like to invite Julie to come and present her first work. Julie, thank you. Thanks, thanks for that intro, Hannah. Uh, yeah, it's really uh, uh, very excited to be here. I love doing uh, ODI talks, always super interesting. So I'm going to talk today about um, two very specific projects. And one is a, a recent project um, called Active Living Infrastructure controlled environment but just as a little bit of um, a background like Hannah said I'm the art associate and we've been working with the ODI on their data as culture art program for nearly 10 years now um, working with loads of different artists and um, working across loads of different art forms one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is is um, data from natural systems so the idea that everything we um, see in a sort of like a, a digital medium is translated by data into to our screens or to audio devices and the, the data becomes a really important communication um, method so it's it's the thing that links machine to machine that links machines to humans and also increasingly links humans to hum humans as we communicate with our devices so data is at the heart of all that and as an artist I feel like it's really for me, if you're, you know, if you're not working with data in a sort of critical and curious way, because it's then, then kind of what are you thinking about? It's one of the most prevalent materials of our time. And it's really fascinating to work with. And one of the things I enjoy doing is not necessarily looking at data as an idea of truth or evidence, but looking at data as a playful, malleable material. So this idea that data can be an art material. Um, this, this project that I've recently, um, displayed at the VNA as part of their digital design weekend is called Active Living Infrastructure Controlled Environment, ALICE for short. Um, and it's a, a collaboration, a very deep collaboration with um, Rachel Armstrong from Newcastle University, um, Yanis Iropoulos from um, Bristol, soon to be, and Southampton universities, and, and with a whole um, team of people around us. And one of the things that we're interested in doing is kind of looking at um, microbial fuel cells, which use urine to generate electricity and then creating an artwork out of that. So the project was very much about how can we try and help, um, how can we understand what this system is doing and how can we create an artwork that kind of dispels the myth of 
of the dirty. So if if um, we're using urine, human urine to, to power things, how can we make that a kind of an acceptable thing to think about? What would it mean if we can recycle ourselves, which is exact, which is pretty much what the work is doing? Um, so I came up with the concept to try and create a whole digital artwork that is powered um, by human waste, liquid human waste. And when you're working with the digital art forms, I increasingly, and which I've been doing for maybe nearly 20 years now, I was thinking about you know the energy that is used, the way that that work is represented, the way that it lives online, and all of the resources that it takes to do that. So for me, this project was very important in terms of the climate emergency, looking at alternatives to fossil fuels, not just to, to generate power in our homes and, and the systems around us, but also to 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 power the artworks that we're making and to in, you know and to interrogate these kind of new forms of energy that are being created. So this piece is this is um, an installation shot from the V&A, and this is before the the the, um, the power is ramped up. And what you can see is this kind of globe-like structure that has got a series of microbial fuel cells inside that are being powered um, by the liquid human waste. And you can see that the power is generating um, low level LEDs. It's also controlling, it's also powering a, a small computer, which is doing the data collection. And then the data that is collected, which is data about um, pH levels, the amount of energy being produced, the temperature and, and some sort of ambient information like that. And then I'm taking that information and using it to create an animation and soundscape. So as well as the physical piece, which kind of glows um, and sort of flips between these two states, like a sort of en energy heartbeat, um, it also generates enough data for me to create uh, an animation. And the animation is, is um, based on a bacterial foraging algorithm. So it looks at this, which is a, an artificial life algorithm. And then it generates animation and, and the, the dynamics and the, the rhythm and the, the flow of the animation is all controlled by the power that's being generated. One of the things that is, I'm going to try and flip to it now. One of the things that it does is it enables you to either experience the data as this kind of like essential um, dynamic system, but you can also find out what is happening within the microbial fuel cells and see what's going on with the power. So the overlays in this, and you can look at this, it's live online now. You can see how much useful energy is being generated. You can see what the, the, the voltage of the stack is, and you can see what each individual microbial fuel cell um, how many millivolts is being created. So it's a combination, you know, it's a very much an art science project that is a combination of um, creating um, a visual artwork and a sonic artwork, but also this data visualization as well. And that's, if you want to look at it, that's at aliceinterface.eu. Um, that's Alice. I'm going to hand over to Rohini now and she can talk to you a bit about some of her work. Thanks, Julie. Thanks so much. Um, I love Alice, as you know, uh, and I was first was introduced to it when we did this talk at the VNA. And I think, um, as I mentioned then, and I'm going to just say it again because it's still true. Um, what's interesting about Alice is the way uh, when you've described it as saying that we can have digital conversations with microbes about household resources, which gives us this kind of data about our own consumption and what we discard. But for me, it feels a lot like what you're doing is making something um, visible and making audible protagonists that we you know, overlook, which brings me to um, the work I'd like to share today, which um, I'm just going to jump into, sorry, just, yeah, hopefully this is coming, yeah. So <clears throat> I think a, a lot of the work or this particular body of work is also about making <clears throat> things visible and drawing attention to things perhaps that we don't necessarily think about a lot. Uh, also, I just want to take this opportunity to thank um, Hannah, Julie, and everyone at the ODI just for this amazing opportunity to be an artist in residence. Um, it's been fantastic, and I can't wait to see what else happens. But um, basically, as Hannah has said, I am an amateur astronomer, I am an artist, I'm also an eclipse chaser, and I'm interested in using scientific, artistic, and speculative frames to understand our constant transformation or our relation, the way our relationship to the planet keeps transforming. 
So the work I'm sharing with you is based out of research that is set here, which is a result of other research that I've done with communities of amateur astronomers in Delhi and in India. And I'm interested in what this group of people that is so enthralled by the night sky might tell us about you know, the way that we make um, meaning, if you like. Um, so this site is called the Kodai Canal Solar Observatory. It's in the southern part of India. And where every day, weather permitting, since 1904, the staff at the observatory have recorded images um, of the sun. And this data, which spans 115 years, comprises 157,000 distinct portraits of our nearest star. So 157,000 suns, observations that range from hand-drawn sunspots on small disks of paper, like you see here, which are really quite um, extraordinary. Uh, these range to uh, glass photographic plates. And of course, now they have uh, H-alpha calcium H images as well. But for me, what's interesting is that each of these sort of tens of thousands of suns are sort of archetypes, you know, in a sense. Each is a conjunction of direct observation and experience on one hand, but of course, also information and data on the other. So I'm just going to quickly share um, a very short snippet of a film. Um, there is very ambient sound. I'll just talk over this a little bit and then I'll let you uh, see it. So essentially this piece is called 300 kilometers or the apparent path sun. And it's a double channel video, which I've sort of chopped into two so that you can experience it a little bit uh, better. But one of the oldest instruments at the Kodai Canal Observatory is a spectroheliograph, which is a really wonderful device for photographing the surface of the sun in a particular spectrum. Um, and this has been in operation since 1905. So for the film, I recorded the movement of the sun across the spectroheliograph's metal plate. So that's what you're looking at right now, the sun moving across the spectroheliograph plate. But usually what happens is that the instrument is continuously tracking the sun, right? So that the sun is kept in the middle and that's where the glass plate was put and then you took a recording of the sun. But in this case, I asked the astronomer to disable the tracking device. So the sun moves across the metal plate as it moves through the sky. But of course, it's not the sun that moves. As our planet rotates on its axis, it, cre it creates the sun's apparent motion. So what we see in the film or the double channel work is the Earth's movement suddenly made visible. So it's a movement of 460 meters per second, or 30 kilometers per minute, or 300 kilometers in the 10 minutes it takes for the image to, of the sun to cross the screen. So this is one channel, and the second channel, which will come very soon, you will see the words of a longtime amateur astronomer and friend, Raj Shekhar. That's these are his words, and um, Raj is wonderful. I feel like he's or he was a philosopher. Um, he, he has this wonderful meditation on the sun, which for him has great personal meaning. So his text follows in the second channel. And, you know, Raj sort of becomes a conduit between this celestial environment and our reading of it. And I'll just leave you with Raj's words for just about a minute, and then I will switch back.
Thanks, Rohini. I mean, I, I love that piece of work. There's so much in there that um, that really kind, kind of, and we've talked about this before, but actually it's just even more triggers in my brain. I think one of the things in the context of the, of the, context of the ODI is that um, the, the amount of analog data that is there and is stored that wouldn't, that, that has been there for, you know, over a hundred years that Rohini has been able to, it's really tangible. You can feel it and you can look at what you're doing. But it also made me think about, you know, the idea of analog preservation is kind of n not really talked about in the world of data so much. And it does make me wonder how much of the stuff we're collecting now, whether it's even um, how it's going to be represented in the future, how it, if it's even going to be um, available and understandable to anyone. But I love the idea as well that 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 work makes us think about how we are in orbit with something else. So rather than everything moving around us, it's us that is moving around. It is us that's kind of like a little fragment on the outside that is kind of peering in at all these different systems. And that's something that really um, resonates with me. And it kind of, that, that brings me to, to what I was trying to do with a piece of work called Interference. And in Interference, this is a virtual reality piece um, that I did with Abandoned Normal Devices and Jodrell Bank Observatory. And the, the, I was working with scientists from um, who are looking at pulsars and pulsars are, are, are stars that are in the sky, dying stars. And each pulsar has a signature. So each and each signature is kind of like a, it's like, almost like a tiny sound wave, if you like, and they all have their own spinning rhythm. So that when you're if you're a pulsar hunter, if you're detecting it, pulsars, you get to understand that there's there's hundreds of these dying stars, but they're all sort of spinning at a certain rate, which um, appears in the data to be kind of like a rhythmic um, moment. So one of the things that made sense to me was if I was trying to make a piece of artwork about it was to look at, to look at those rhythms and to see how we could place ourselves within the orbits of these pulsars. So I made this VR work called Interference and it used, um, the, the idea was to not create a VR work that looked like something's sort of, I didn't want to represent reality. We can see reality, that's pretty straightforward. I wanted to represent that the algorithmicness of the way that pulsars and astronomy um, works, so that to try and represent the data in a very kind of abstract form. So what you're seeing here is a still image from when you go into the, the VR experience first, you see these kind of spinning pulsars that are rotating and spinning and you're in a sound field and underneath the feet is kind of like this rippling floor. So everything is dynamic and everything is changing, but also everything is repeating. And in, in Rohini's film, um, this idea that nature repeats itself over and over again is something that data is really good at flagging up because we can detect the patterns so easily. So within the, this VR experience, you walk through and the idea is a kind of like a hunting game is that you put your head inside these spinning shapes. So as you get closer to them, you can put your head inside. And then once your your head, you, you become the sounds start to orbit around your head. And, and a lot of them are kind of like deep um, it's called dub rib, reggae bass lines. So they're very immersive. It's very atmospheric. It's very um, uh, consuming and then when you put your head in the pulsar then you get flipped into a different world so this is one of the worlds which is a very sort of ethereal nighttime world another world um, of these different shades this is the uh, orange one and they all have different rhythms and they've all got different kind of feels to them some of them are calmer some of them are a bit more frenetic and then um, the idea is that the more of these pulsars you hunt, what you can see there is this kind of, is you're beginning to see the Jodrell Bank um, telescope itself being drawn in scriggles in the background. So that's the kind of aim of, uh, aim of the game, if you like. And if you get the pulsar discovery, that's your reward. But this work was very much about how to, I mean, in the context of, um, Rohini's work, she was just talking about the, the, the idea that those spectroheliographs are the things that captured, that that machine captured these, these images that can be viewed later. With pulsars, the thing that's being captured is just pure, massive, massive data sets. So it's the idea of representing them in a way that is kind of um, uh, complementary to the way that the data is collected in the first place by putting someone in a dataverse itself.
so that's interference and it's um yeah and it was um shown at the blue dot festival god back in um 2019 i'll hand back over to rohini to talk about her next work thanks judy again um so many amazing sort of resonances between uh, our practice so i think this piece I really, I mean, I love Alice, I love all the work, but this one really speaks to me because there is something really interesting about thinking about noise as a kind of tapestry with depths that are really worth sounding, you know? And I've also worked with radio astronomy, but in a totally different register, but there's such a, it's just amazing because it's such an exercise in making sense out of noise, right? And the idea that you pinpoint an extraterrestrial source and you have to eliminate all the other local noise, noise from the ground, noise from the Earth's atmosphere, noise from, other radio telescopes, a sort of distilling of sort of pure noise. And I think an interference noise, as you've already said, is information. But the atmosphere that you're creating is both sonic, it's spatial, and um, it's generated by and inhabited by the viewer also. You know, this idea that you have to sort of also be it. The la I, the last time I remember you mentioned this amazing thing where you can stick your head inside a pulsa, you know, that image. Or, or even the idea that you can listen into a radio telescope is just, um, I love that. Because I also think that um, the work that I'm going to talk about next, radio telescopes and atmospheres play a part, but in a, on a different register. So I will just very quickly share the site first so that we have a sense of what we're looking at. So um, another thing just to mention is that a lot of the work ends up being um, rather specific. Sorry, here we go. Yeah, just so you see it. Um, a lot of the work ends up being uh, Coming, comes out of my engagement with sites. Uh, and this particular piece is uh, the Gauri Bidnu Radio Telescope Array, which is in the south of India also, just north of Bangalore. And it's operated by the Raman Research Institute and the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. Uh, so the observatory has two kinds of telescopes. One are these, which are these older decameter wave radio telescopes. So basically they're 1000 dipoles arranged in this sort of T configuration. And these have been in operation since 1976. And then you have these newer sort of, you know, really amazing looking uh, spectral I mean, sort of radio heliographs, which are used to obtain two dimensional pictures of the outer solar corona. So I will just very quickly share the video or the film that was the result of this um, experience. There is no sound. So um, yeah, I'll just talk over it again, just very briefly. So what I did when I went here um, was that I was thinking uh, very much of I mean, what I did essentially is that I collected material recordings of the sky every day with a fisheye lens that was pointed at the zenith. And when I looked at the material, what occurred to me or what seemed to me is that there was sort of, it kept, you know, invoking for me the blue marble image, you know, that iconic image of the earth, which was taken by the crew of uh, Apollo 17 on its way to the moon on December 7th, 1972. And this is one of the most reproduced images in history. And at the end of the 1960s, you know, it sort of replaced the mushroom cloud as this kind of global icon of the post-war period. And of course, now this view of Earth from outer space was an event of historical importance. You know, it transformed our consciousness. It made us think about the Earth's ecosystem as a single unit. And our present as well, when we think about the climate debate and the concept of the Anthropocene is shaped by this notion of one planet. So this piece, which is called Atmospheres, um, we see the earth, but from our perspective on the ground. So what we see are these shifting um, scenes of sky and cloud, where the sky becomes a kind of mirror. And with the camera lens, as I said, pointed at the zenith, you see the earth uh, bisected, trisected by these decameter radio telescopes and also by the very strange uh, and quite amazing radio heliographs, which are these sort of really, I feel like they're almost chimeric. You know, they're one thing standing in for something else, looking at something else looking in the most uh, abstract sense. Yeah, so this is just uh, another minute or so, and then.
Brilliant. Thank yep. you so much, Rohini and Julie. Really great to get those introductions to your work. So um, I would like to invite people who are watching if they'd like to paste any questions into the chat, I'll look out for them. I've got, um, oh, <laughs> a lovely comment from Neil Burston. Wow, the sort of phrases I didn't anticipate hearing at the regular Friday lunchtime. Uh, brilliant, thank you, Neil. Um, I'll jump in with the questions. We don't have a direct question right now, which is, Julie, as a pioneer of um, working with data as an art material specifically, um, spe specifically in a research-led context, um, can you speak about why it's been such an enduring concern for you and so central uh, to the ways you translate nature? You touched on that a bit earlier, but I don't know if you can just sort of push it a bit. Uh, yeah, I think that um, uh, I, I just want to say, actually, Ro like Rohini, something that popped into my head then was that the, the image of the blue marble is this thing where it's supposed to be unifying. We're all one. We're all from this world and it's all the same. And you that your view is this very super, super personal perspective of that from one particular place. And yet that, the, 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 yeah, it's just it's a really nice. Um, I think it's a some, somewhat in some ways even more powerful. But um, yeah, so for, for me with data as the, I did touch on it a bit and I think it's it's really fundamental to, to the amount of technology that we use now in our lives to be thinking about what data is and how it is represented and what, what we're doing with it. And um, one of the things in my research that I looked at was this idea of the data flow. And that's about all of the subjective moments within the process of working with data that we come across where people are making decisions humans are making decisions at every single point of the way as well as machines making some of the deficient decisions but you you know when you're collecting data the first thing you're thinking about is is what you're going to collect how you're going to collect you know what you're going to collect with so all of those steps is kind of if you're in a if you're in a particular if you want to collect bird data and you're in a particular location you're going to select the birds that are most familiar to you, which might be completely different to someone who's got a different, uh, who lives in a, in a different place. And then how you select them is based on your access to equipment, how much money you've got, what, what you're aware of. And there's so many different um, points, even in just the data collection. And then that, fo that flows through the rest of the, the, the process of working with data. So even down to the algorithms that you choose to analyze it, the way that you store it, how much data you drop out. So the reason that um, and Rohini touched on this for me um, in interference is called interference because it's looking at you have to strip away so much data to get to the heart of the matter. And then you end up with this very it's a very subtract subtractive methodology where you dump most of the stuff you're collecting and you only choose the bits that are most relevant to your research. And so even that is a kind of subjective matter. You have to decide, you have to write an algorithm that makes sure um, that it only retains the stuff that you think is interesting or that matches your research. And it always begs the question of, well, how do we know what isn't interesting? How do we know what isn't, what we need to keep? Because we're asking certain questions and we've got certain agendas. So for me, the idea of data um, being very manipulable, very mutable, very kind of um, very very much something that we control rather than this kind of being out there and it's saying this is a this is the definite thing that the data is telling us and that's why i feel like framing it as an art material is really important because as soon as you do that you're kind of like yeah of course it's a material that means artists will interpret it in different ways that means that we can use it differently and so that's kind of at the heart of, of my research. It's at the heart of how I, when I'm thinking about other people's artwork, I always want to know what data they're using, what the granularity is, what type of data it is. And it makes a difference, you know, if you're using real time live data, there's something very exciting about the work because it's the world here and now. If you're using a set of archive data, then there's something historical and a bit maybe different about it because you know it's never going to change. So there's no unpredictability in an archival work. All of these different things have give your artwork a different context. And, um, and for me, that's really, that's really interesting. And I feel there's a lot of ways that you can dig deeper into the idea of data um, than is kind of initially thought when you, just, when, when you just call everything that involves data, data art, it's, it's too generic.
Thank you so much, Julie. Maybe we'll come back to whether the archive can be unpredictable or not. Uh, it might, might be something for Rohini to riff on. But before you do that, Rohini, I'd love it if you could talk about the fact that you've always worked with observation, and obviously observation is a form of data collection. Um, but through this project we've been doing together, where you've come as an artist in residence, you've started to think about your work in the context of data and all the, the, the frames that Ju uh, Julie's just outlined. Um, can you talk about what that realisation has meant for your practice, and maybe a little bit about some of the conversations that you've initiated with um, some of the specialists at the ODI as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you have, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think um, I have never thought of myself as working with data. Uh, I've used the word, yeah, as you said, observation, recordings of my own as well as of others. And I work with materials of many different kinds, but I don't think I ever used the word data. And I've been thinking about that a lot since we began the residency in July. Uh, and I think it has to do um, something to do with the idea that, you know, a data has to be produced by some sort of a, an authority. Uh, but of course, I do work with data and um, this work, and, uh, and I work with many different kinds of data, with emergent systems, with video feedback. But I think what I have realized a lot is that when you start to articulate more clearly, when I start to articulate more clearly within the work as well, that everything, you know, then whether it's an image, whether it's a frame of reference, whether it's a construct, essentially all the forms of mediation become a way not so much to quantify, at least in my work, but a way to read, you know, the environment. And that in turn helps me better understand how the environment in turn shapes us. And the main thing, of course, is that no observation is ever unmediated. That's an absolute, you know, sort of conceit. And I think that the past few months have made me think much more deeply about the people and the forms, both embodied and technological, that the mediation takes. So for instance, the way I started at the, um, started the ODI residency, because of course, also I cannot be there, unfortunately. So one of the best things or one of the most important things for me very much felt to place the people at the center, you know, because it's the way that I, I work with amateur astronomers as well. Um, astronomy is what I love as well, but it's how it comes through. It's how they, it's channeled, how people become the conduit. So for instance, at the ODI, I've been talking to different people and the questions are always the same um, sometimes, but the answers are always very different. So like one of the things I really wanted to try and understand is how everybody understood data. What does data mean? And I think different people had such amazingly different perspectives on it. Just some of the highlights. So Deborah, for instance, had this lovely thing where she says, of course, good data practices are about the people and not the data or the practices. This must be obvious to all of you, but it just, again, basically puts the people at the center, right? Olivier had a lovely, lovely um, definition of data where he says, data is how we observe what we care about. And I love that because it basically encompasses so much, no? And of course, this idea of the digital twin has come up a lot, which I think is super, but I really want to subvert that a little bit. I'm, I'm interested in like, what would an analog twin look like? I don't know. And, and again, what Julie said, this idea of the archive and actually really playing with that, you know, again, this idea of the authority of the archive, the fact that it's unchangeable. So yeah, it's all, so let's look at things as I love again, Julie, when she talks about data being playful, I love that she's made it so malleable because I did think of it as being quite, a box and i think that box is now shifting a bit which is which is very good that 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 thing there the, the idea of reading using data to read and uh, rather than quantify is is so important it's such a subtle thing that actually when you're because when we when we observe people and when we observe environments we get a sense of the essence of that environment we get this kind of like very broad very kind of contextual moment and that is something that data is is not very good at because it kind of like sort of shifts away a little bit from that i mean not always but generally so the the kind of i think sometimes when i particularly talk about my animations as the essence of a data stream or a data um set that's kind of that's kind of what i'm meaning i think you just um it's said it really really nicely there and i think there is an you know because it is so broad and time-based data particularly has this kind of ebb and flow that it's got a sort of biological form to it because it's constantly moving and shifting like natural systems do. Thanks, Julie. Um, what well, question for both of you. 
um, which is um, if you can talk a bit more about that tension between the collection of data allowing insights beyond our anecdotal or observational conclusions, and also how those collection and analysis mechanisms can equally reduce complexity to a point where the truth lies, the where the point the point where where the truth lies becomes increasingly fuzzy. Um, and I was really struck um, with your piece, 300 kilometers, uh, Rahini, in how the sun is this very sharp, clear disk, which is not really what the sun looks like. You know, it's this constant stream of particles. But, and also in interference, Julie, you've sought to create a very pared down aesthetic to immerse people in that complexity through simplicity. It'd be lovely to hear you both say a bit more about that. Do you want to go first, Julie? Okay, sorry, I was looking at Rohini. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, yeah, the idea of um, of simplicity, I don't know, it's a perception of simplicity, because actually it's quite a, that, you know, is always very complex behind the scenes, um, the, how the systems are built. And then um, th there's also, a, uh, I think with interference, there's a lot of, it's kind of like a massive framework and then the data is then sort of popped into it to, to push dynamic into the system. So the framework itself is quite complex and there's quite a lot that goes into that. And then the data is the thing that's like added as, as fuel or energy to the, to the animation that really like brings it alive and makes it something that becomes changeable and shifting and immersive. Um, but the idea of this, the fuzzy truth in, in, in a data, I mean, there, there's, it's hard not to like roll out that old saying about if you, something about if you interrogate, if you torture the data enough, then it will um, confess to something. <laughs> and it's true because you can, you know, there are so many different ways to, to analyze data and to look at it. And we do have, we do have our own lens. We do have our own lens. And there's an, there's an aspect of, you know, the more experienced and expert you are in a certain field means that you can, you can work with data in a particular way to, to understand it. I mean, if you look at um, the way that the COVID data is being analyzed and, and the models that are coming out of that, that are coming out really fast with the new variant, suddenly they're modeling how that might work. That is like unbelievably, um, expert people do it doing stuff that is that is very skillful um it's still not necessarily truth and it's always whenever you listen even this morning i was listening they always back it up with well this is just a model and this is just speculation and this is and it's but that gets kind of cut out of the headline when it's kind of like new south african variant all oh, the borders going to be shut again the context disappears and so there is a fuzzy truth and the truth comes from how we how we talk ab about those results, I guess, and how um, how it impacts people. So, no, no, that's happen. great. You're not, but I'm going to stop you there because you sound like you've stopped. <laughs> so, Rahini, <laughs> would you like to respond to this question of fuzzy yeah. truth and complexity? No, no, it's I, actually you articulated something that is at the heart of a lot of this stuff. So, if, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it specifically within like this sort of realm of the amateur astronomer's experience, it's an interesting analogy. You know, there's this kind of vast gulf between um, the virtual and the real. So for instance, all these aircraft, uh, aircraft and sorry, you know, telescopes like Hubble, spacecraft like Cassini, we have these ultra eight, you know, 4K, 8K, ultra HD images of so many entities, if you like, that have taken up mean, you know, place, they've taken up places in our imagination, in our lives. Um, and the experience though in the field with a telescope or a binocular is totally different. So I remember asking an amateur astronomer how he deals with the false expectations and the very often the anticlimax that results from a first time observation. And he said, you know, that moment of, is, is that all? And his answer is you have to remind people of where they are and of what they are seeing, that the light from that object has traveled so far before hitting the photo, the receptive photons in their eyes. So as an experience, it's very visceral, it's bodily. Um, it's unique, but it's also part of this kind of shared collective, you know, this sense of, so I think what happens with, um, even when I first saw the sun moving across the spectroheliograph at the observatory, the first thing you think is that, you know, it's so small, you know, and then you look, you look closer, and then you notice the very slight oscillation in the disk of the sun, and then the astronomer by your side tells you, oh, that's not, uh, that's because of the Earth's atmosphere. You're suddenly seeing the Earth's atmosphere. And that's why the sun is doing this, you know? And then you realize that it's, then he tells you that the sun isn't moving, the Earth is moving. 
and you have this incredible and uncomfortable feeling of vertigo because you're suddenly aware of your position on the planet. So with the film, I overlaid NASA visual footage, visual data of the sun, which is in the public domain, uh, so which does display the sort of dynamism of the sun. So then you have this kind of telescoping, you know, which is in and out. So both the way that the spectroheliograph records the sun, also the way the way maybe we now see it. But yeah, I, I like the fuzziness of it. And I agree with, uh, I agree with Julie also. It's a bit, uh, it's an interesting area to sort of operate in. Great, thank you so much. I'd like to jump right back down to Earth, or I suppose we've been one foot in both, both camps, um, and talk about Alice a little bit more, Julie, um, because it's part of a movement in art and design towards recognising that, you know, the future of the planet depends on us working with it to recognise that um, we, we need to coexist and not just treat ourselves as sort of masters of the natural systems, but but part of it. We're, we're part of this immeasurable system. Um, can you say something about how this interface is? I know you talked about, you know, wanting to move beyond perceptions of waste, but I, I don't know if you'd like to elaborate on that. Uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, the Alice project, it's and it's it's um, it stems from when I started working with Rachel and Yanis, the what they were trying to do was work um, with microbial fuel cells as, a, as an architectural object, if you like. So um, what I didn't really explain was that, that we've been calling them living bricks and the idea that um, these these microbial fuel cells, which are which can can generate power, can be used as bricks to build walls in your house, for instance, and you can build a wall, then you can um, make the plumbing from your from your bathroom or wherever sort of feed into the wall and then it, you'd have this kind of constant circular system that is generating power for um, for as long as that there's as long as there's kind of like feedstock going into it and this idea is kind of expanded into the idea of programmable programmable buildings and programmable biology where we think about not kind of like getting rid of our waste but actually using using things in a, in a small circular economy so that we can um, tread lightly on the on the planet's resources and and the technology microbial fuel cells has been around for for decades it's not a new technology at all but it hasn't been adopted at scale it hasn't been adopted for various reasons i think one of them because because it does involve human waste and that's problematic for people it's seen to be something that they don't want to contend with um, so the whole project is about how we can think about small small moments of transformative energy generation in our in our homes. And I think that if we if we stop thinking about buildings in terms of something that is just a structure and that becomes something that actually we can work with and that is alive in some way and that we bring nature and we bring microbes and we use microbes in a way that is kind of like joyful and helpful. Um, it's been compounded by the, the idea that these invisible viruses and visible microbes are kind of generally bad, but actually there's loads and loads of helpful ones. It's just a case of us learning to work with them and um, making an active decision, actually, that it's what we want to do and that it's a good thing rather than, than, than something that is, uh, is not. And, um, yeah, and Alice has got some, I mean, there's, there's a bigger picture with Alice and that we've done this first installation, but I think that it's going to go on to be smaller installations that either you can have. So if you look at um, in, in uh, refugee camps for humanitarian purposes, it's a perfect solution for people to be able to recycle their waste and provide power. And that power can be used to maybe provide um, power to provide a to power a server so that you can got internet connectivity and so on so it can really be a fundamental game changer for, for places that are outside of the normal electricity infrastructure that's so interesting it's such a i mean in spite of all the dread and doom about you know the direction of travel in terms of how climate how we're impacting the planet the potential of all these new innovations is really really exciting and sort of moving away from that sense of if you think about traditional um you know home maintenance you're sort of constantly trying to fight against nature sort of the sort of materials that are used to sort of 
patch or crack in a wall or something, for example, a, a very sort of anti-breathing, close it all down. And this, this is really interesting. Um, equally, Rohini, you talked about um, atmospheres, your film, and how it allows that sort of response to the iconic blue marble image, but actually getting a perspective looking up from the earth. And I think I've said to you before, one of the things that really appeals to me about that artwork is the way you take, we're used to seeing the horizon as a vertical band and you wrap it up into this precious ball with sort of the earth very, very faintly visible all the way around it. And um, I think it, it, it's something about its insistence that here we are on the ground, it really places us, it does give you that, vertiginous feeling that the sun piece also gives us that we're in constant motion but also that we're we're here I don't know if this is a question <laughs> rather it's more like a comment you know an appreciation but I don't know if you'd like to expand on that or if anyone yeah. else would like to pop a question we do have time for one or two questions yeah I mean I think um sorry yeah just to say I I totally agree I feel like we're so much a part of the system maybe we don't even realize it so I'm just going to share something which I think blew my mind uh, when, I mean, it's, so this is the image, right, that we were talking about. This is the blue on marble, which is that famous image. So it was taken um, by the crew of Apollo 17, but from a distance of 29,000 kilometers from the Earth's surface. So this image, of course, was color corrected, and it was then adjusted to show the United States eventually, right, uh, rather than Africa, which is, and this is one of the most accessed images on Flickr, 5 million downloads, etc. But then in 2000, and, sorry, yeah, in 2012, NASA created another version of the blue marble, which was photographed by a satellite, which orbited the Earth at approximately 930 kilometers above the Earth. So from this height, altitude, whatever, it is not possible to take one image of the Earth. It's not possible. You would have to go another 11,000 kilometers out, right? So this new image is actually a composite of a series of a digital images. So it's really interesting because the distance between these two is very complex, it's very layered, because in the time between 1972 and 2012, so much has changed. I mean, the planet has changed, obviously, literally. But let's look at data as a signifier. So there's a really wonderful book, which is called How to See the World by Nicholas uh, Merzoff. Merz Merzoff, yeah. And he talks about how the human race in the year 2012 took 380 billion photographs. 380 billion photographs just that year, nearly all digital. In the year before, in 2011, there were 1 trillion visits to YouTube, right? And he puts it really well. I'm just going to end with one amazing quote. And he says, the 2012 blue marble is made to seem as if it was taken from one place in space, but it was not. It is accurate in each detail, but it is false in that it gives you the illusion of having been taken from a specific place at one moment in time. Such tile rendering is a standard means of constructing digital imagery. It is a good metaphor for how the world is visualized today. We assemble a world from pieces, assuming that what we see is both coherent and equivalent to reality until we discover it is not, end quote. So I think atmosphere sort of offers you the perspective that another way to look at a whole is from much closer, you know, like, yeah. I mean, that's really resonant in these times where it's only in the last few years that um, Heino Falka, I think, and other teams, many, many teams work collaboratively to build up the image of the black hole. But of course, we might call it an image or a photograph of a black hole, but it's multiple data centers comparing multiple data sets and forming a, a picture of reality or a picture of something we think we want to understand through that. And um, that, that, that amount of complexity is, is really central to this conversation, really, actually that how we're imaging and picturing the world is, is this sort of aggregate project, aggregate and collaborative project, uh, which is really, yeah, kind of mind blowing. It, it is, and that kind of, when you see that image, the second image particularly, then you don't necessarily think, oh, that's a composite of so many images and that's, you know, all of those thought processes don't generally happen. What lingers is, is just that image of the planet that is taken from a North American perspective, particularly. And it, um, so that's what, and that's what travels forward. So that's the, I mean, it shows the power of kind of those really stunning, really uh, momentous images that get released. Yeah. And also how history gets kind of sculpted around that and not necessarily the, the detail around it. 
and I think that that um, it makes me think of in terms of data and the and and the interrelations between different data sets that make it mean something. The context we we're talking about is um, the Norma Norma Batesman and her the warm data lab that they've been looking at that, and that's really interesting because it's a kind of um, that it's talking about a similar thing. It's about how do things interrelate, how do they cross over, where is the context, what does it mean, and I think that's an interesting. It's an interesting little rabbit hole to go down. It yeah. is. I mean, interrelationship is a really feels really significant in terms of how we're going to address a lot of the issues we've got at the moment. Um, I think someone's just put something in the chat. Just check if there, it's just some nice links. So Mohini and Julie have both been dropping links into the chat. We're actually at the end. Um, we're going to need to drop off now, but just to say thank you very, very much indeed for coming along to this lunchtime lecture. Um, thanks to Julie Freeman, thanks to Rahini Devasher, um, and obviously to Freya and the ODI team for producing it. Um, more about Julie's practice, I dropped it in the chat, but it's translatingnature.org. Rohini's practice is at her website, rohinidevasher.com. And if you want to know more about the Data as Culture program, which is where we'll also put updates about Rohini's residency and the outcomes of the residency when she creates new work next year, that's at culture.bodi.org. Um, and I'll just say thank you very, very much to the speakers. I'm moving my face between windows. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Thank Thanks, Hannah. Good to see you. Good to chat to you, Rahini and Hannah.